Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. We'll start in exactly five minutes. I think we have some speakers who are lost. So we're trying to fix that. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, we have located all our speakers, so now we're ready to start. Uh, thank you so much for being here on the last day of IGF, we really appreciate it. Um, this panel is called Fake News Content Regulation and Platformization of the Web. Um, it's part of a project that uh, Dr. Stefania Milan and I uh, have been collaborating on for six months. Uh, and I think uh, just to give you a quick idea of where uh, this project started and why we thought it was a good idea. We were together on uh, November 9th, 2016, at an ICANN meeting um, when you know the U.S. presidential election results became known to all of us. And what we heard was um, this knee-jerk reaction to people asking for regulation of content and fact-checking. And uh, we found that deeply problematic and also uncomfortable because as uh, human rights activists and people who work on digital rights, usually we look for nuance in the work that we do and we try and understand how to configure principles. But at this point, because it was such a you know, significant event, we saw that there was like a knee-jerk reaction to what platforms should be doing and how we understand content on uh, the internet and how we think about freedom of expression. So I'm a lawyer and Stefania is a social scientist. Um, and so we both had very specific uh, questions. So I was worried about, you know, how do we configure international uh, law and international human rights standards to this entire debate? And Stefania was more worried about, you know, the public and private sphere and how do we understand platforms becoming such an uh, integral part of the internet. And so we decided it was time to kind of move beyond our, our disciplinary questions and start challenging each other across disciplines. And so that was the birth of this project. Um, we've been very lucky to be funded by the um, uh, Annenberg School of Communication, sorry. Um, and so this panel is kind of like uh, the second time that we're thinking about these questions in this format. And so we're very happy to have a great lineup uh, this morning. I'll now leave it to Stefania to talk about some of the questions we'll be asking and then swiftly move on to our amazing speakers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, Vidushi. So, um, next slide, please. We just put for you the questions in, um, in the slide so that they are going to uh, inspire also the discussion afterwards. So, we are curious for this uh, time round, this specific panel, to explore the issue of fake news and content regulation as it unfolds in this whole global south as a shorthand for a number of countries that are represented here and many others that are unfortunately not here but hopefully are going to be evoked uh, in the conversation also with the help of the audience. So we ask ourselves what trends and developments in the global south specifically right now 
um, assuming that sometimes uh, in many of these countries there is um, maybe a, a weaker uh, rural law, for example, therefore the challenges might be uh, bigger. And then is the so-called platformization of uh, the web, in, in a way, you know, the, the sort of invasion by platforms and social media platforms in particular, um, um, in, in our social life, accompanied by uh, adequate safeguards in the, context, in the context of online content regulation in the global south specifically. And finally, and this is not something that is going to um, necessarily be addressed here uh, by the panelists, but we invite you to chip in to answer this question, which is one of the, uh, the questions that animate our project. How uh, current internet governance frameworks and processes find relevance in the age of platformization of the internet? We're all very fond of the multi-stakeholder model, but what does it mean when, for example, it's extremely hard to get uh, these platforms, the representatives from these platforms, to actually come to the podium with us and discuss this? you know, on the sort of same uh, space. We have an impressive lineup of eight speakers. It's a very ambitious program. We also study a little late to give you all of you the chance to, uh, to come here and find us. So um, the way we structure the conversation today is the following. We have four uh, speakers, then a short round of uh, Q&A. Um, please remember to uh, state your name and affiliation when introduce your question and in the interest of um, allowing everyone to participate. Please be short in both question and answer. And then we're going to have a second um, round of inputs from uh, the panel here and more questions and answers at the end. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, call upon Stephanie Felsberger from Egypt to um, go ahead with our five, six minutes provocation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I, I want to say uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this conversation. Um, I, I have a few uh, points that I'd like to make about the role that platforms play in Egypt and from the uh, Egyptian perspective. So I'll address quickly um, the context in which they operate uh, and then how content regulation in the broadest sense works because it works a little bit different uh, in Egypt. So to illustrate how central Facebook has become for daily life in Egypt, um, it's definitely not as important as those articles in 2011 about Facebook revolutions would like you to believe. But Facebook is a very, very crucial part of everyday life for both citizens and governments and newspapers. Um, to illustrate this, Facebook is used um, in ID, uh, to ID people in checkpoints. So if the police stops you somewhere, you don't have your ID, they will ask you to uh, check your Facebook. Um, Facebook is also routinely checked by police and people get arrested for what they post. This happens on a, on a very regular basis. Um, there are some examples of a kid that uploaded a t-shirt of himself wearing a t-shirt that just said he's anti-torture and he was arrested and he stayed in prison for over a year. And another one is a picture of somebody uploading the picture of the president with Mickey Mouse ears and he also was arrested for that. Um, so. <laughs> to see this it illustrates that the government sees Facebook as a very, very important um, indicator also of what is going on and expressions on Facebook are being taken very seriously. Um, recently, uh, since, uh, since May 24 this year, um, there has been a concerted effort to block um, alternative voices in Egypt. As, uh, as of today, there's a number, very high number of websites blocked. It's 465 websites. Um, these are local international news media websites, everything from Half Post Arabic to Al Jazeera to the local alternative newspapers uh, in Egypt, such as Mada Masr or um, Daily News Egypt. So if you want to go and find out more about what's happening in Egypt, these two websites are a very good uh, place to start. And they also blocked a very, very large number of VPNs. Um, also things like the Wayback Machines, mm -hmm. blogs that stem from a pre-platform era, which uh, where blogs were very, very, there's a vi very vibrant uh, blogger sphere in the 2000 areas. And this is an unprecedented move from the side of the government because before, what happened is more that they, what they used to do with, what they do today with Facebook is what happened with um, news media websites. So instead of targeting the platform <laughs> or shutting down platforms, they would arrest individual um, journalists and, and activists and they would, it would be more targeted information, uh, targeted intimidation. Um, and at the same time, there was more a liberal open policy towards 
um, activities on the on the in the internet. Um, but what we have today <coughs> is basically an information bla uh, block uh, blackout with most independent websites blocked and all exist existing media are very much aligned with the authorities and the military. So very interestingly, what you have now that is accessible in terms of, of news is, yeah, basically fake news, which is a very interesting uh, dynamic compared to what we have internationally. Um, and this is very important because it comes at a time when people were very used to consuming a plethora of different sources of information, and there was a plurality of media that was available in the 2000s. Um, so also this, this closing down of internet websites and blocking websites uh, is taking place in the content of overall closing a freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Um, and it's very interesting so to like illustrate how the Egyptian government sees this, um, Reuters, after interviewed um, with some of, uh, a representative of the authorities about the shutdown of all the news media websites, and his response was, "So, if what if it? So, first of all, they don't acknowledge that it's happening. It's also very difficult to find out who is blocking what because none of the different official government entities that are responsible for regulating this content isn't taking responsibility. Um, but what they said is, so what if it's true? It shouldn't be a problem, right? So." Um, yeah, but what this indicates is that the Egyptian government has decided to control the internet and to see it, the, especially to see it as part of its own national space and to see it as part of its sovereignty. And it's very interesting because they treat international platforms very differently than they do local, local media pages. So they also treat Al Jazeera websites different than they do Facebook and Twitter because so far they haven't shut down access to Facebook and Twitter. Um, but what they've done instead is they've tried to control the way, they tried to basically set the tone on those platforms themselves. So after 2011 and in 2012, 13, the government's moved aggressively onto those platforms and they've started to basically dominate the conversation, um, which happens to an extent, but isn't always uh, possible. Uh, one example is uh, recently the Egyptian government start, uh, hosted a, a global youth forum and uh, they had it under the hashtag, they promoted it under the hashtag, we need to talk, and which was basically a slap in the face of activists and people that have been trying to engage the government with policy suggestions and advice. And um, so, yeah, and what the government also does, which is an interesting twist on how content regulation usually works, because we try to somehow regulate hate speech and violent uh, content, and it's interesting to see that <clears throat> in Egypt, very often it's also the government posting very, very graphic and very explicit content of pictures and videos of supposed terrorists that they have eliminated. Um, and those things, so they never ask for um, Facebook to try and like, take down content because they know themselves that they, they upload a lot of things that would fall under those, under those guidelines. But what they do when it comes to um, regulating and influencing uh, Facebook content is they take down, uh, they, they arrest people and they, they intimidate people. Um, and I wanted to <clears throat> end on one note that isn't maybe specific to the Egyptian context, but I wanted to just stress that for Facebook and Twitter, when we talk about content regulation and they stress that they care about content regulation and I don't know what Facebook's current mission is like, do good or something like that. But I just wanted to stress that whatever content's up there when it comes to Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, for them, it's mainly about profit. So if it's the government uploading violent pictures or people getting arrested for pictures that they upload, in the end, Facebook still profits. Um, and yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to <coughs> end on that note. Thank you. One second, hold on. <laughs> yeah, you can complete, please. Do you want to go here? No. <laughs> yeah. So I think <clears throat> what my main point would be that um, I think content regulation works in very different ways. It's not just online regulations, but it's also offline intimidation. And um, I also wanted to point out that definitely, um, um, yeah, the, the role that Facebook and Twitter have in certain contexts, like in Egypt today, is much more central than it should be because the government is regulating and blocking every access to every other website. So 
a lot of people are forced to rely on Facebook and Twitter and they're, they're forced to be dominated and like subject to Facebook's algorithm and trying to get their voices and their, their news out. And so I think the, the question of, of um, yeah, speaking to those companies about this issue has become more, more relevant. I think that's it. I tend to confuse. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. Sorry for the alarm going off in the middle of your sentence. Uh, the next speaker is a very late addition. We grabbed him yesterday on the fly because I've heard that something quite interesting and scary is happening in Brazil. He kindly agreed to be with us today, so I hope we can share some insights. So, Wagner, um, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Good morning, everyone. Um, <coughs> My name is Wagner Diniz, um, I'm the head of Web Technologies Studies Center at NIC.br NIC in Brazil. And recently the organization I work for with others were asked for helping the Superior Court for Elections on the topic of internet and elections. Then uh, I had the opportunity to co-organize uh, the, this workshop content on internet and elections and invited the speakers from academia, civil society, private sector, and government. The, it's important to make clear that the Superior Court for Election in Brazil, which is not only the court for the regulation of every election in the country, but it also does decide all the legal dispute along the campaigns. I will summarize the consensus and dissensions in this workshop. I will make some bullets because five minutes is hard to discuss every consensus and not in dissensions. The first one is fake news issue is older than the internet. So just read the Bible, you're, you're gonna see a lot of fake news uh, in the wars in the Bible. But the fake news, uh, of course, it's leverage in speed and outreach with social networks and robots. Also, it's necessary to articulate the efforts but if uh, you want to address this issue in the society, it's necessary to put together all the actors in the multi-stakeholder uh, action, political actors, the private sector, and the civil society as well. Uh, the other thing is false profiles are not the same as pseudonymous. So much careful should be taken to not harm ordinary users. The other bullet is any solutions for abuse cannot restrict freedom of expression. Other bullet, it's difficult to establish any kind of law enforcement due to lack of effective control mechanisms. Another one, we should be very careful uh, when we are talking about the use of bots because bots may be at the service of collective interests or in order to harm someone or groups. So bots are not bad in itself and not good in itself. So we have to be very careful. Another bullet, privacy must also be preserved in the virtual environment. One more, it is consensus that fake news affects election results. And finally, the final consensus, consensus is fake news are cheap and profitable business model. So let me move now to what is not consensus or dissensions. Uh, should us move when we find fake news to removing content. So a lot of discussion around this and there was not no consensus about fake news means removing of content. 
The other thing is how to punish those who produce, who shares, and who benefits from fake news. Most of the dissension around this, how to punish who produce and shares and benefits from fake news is because there is a lack of precise definition of what is fake news. So the ordinary TV news are fake news or good news. So we need to be very uh, clear when you talk about this, and I can go back to the, as the assumption of Frank de la Rue in the beginning of this IGF when he says, I don't like the term fake news because I think there is a bit of trap in it. We are confronting campaigns of misinformation. So we should talk about information and misinformation. They are trying to dissuade us from reading news and thinking. And finally, which is also not consensual, oh, we have more, sorry. We should be required or not the disclosure of information source in fake news. So when uh, we find something that don't not agree, uh, we not agree, or we think that we are, they are uh, say something bad towards one a candidate, for instance, in an election, uh, we should ask for a disclosure of in the information source. There is no consensus on, uh, about this because that comes up the discussion about anonymity. What should be the legal process or procedure for removal of content? There is no clear definition clear discussion about the process of procedure for removal of content. Once uh, it's not consensus, we should go to the removal of content. And finally, is there any risk of criminalizing freedom of expression when we are fighting fake news? This is really a big question. And I will recommend you to go to the internet and see the <clears throat> open letter of the civil, Latin America civil society about the, uh, this topic of uh, fake news uh, when they are very clear expressing themselves uh, their opinion about this buzzwords regarding fighting fake news. And the next time I will be back uh, and uh, I try to talk a little bit more what scares the large portion of civil society in Brazil uh, with the recent uh, regulation of uh, uh, about the next election, presidential election in Brazil in 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, now we turn to Amba Kak, who is a lawyer based in India. And not only has she been thinking about this issue, she's also an expert on net neutrality. And so I think it's uh, interesting to marry the two together, especially when we're thinking uh, specifically about platforms and how that changes the debate, if at all. So <coughs> over to you. Thanks, uh, Vidushi and Stephanie, for organizing this panel. So I thought um, I, at the various fake news sessions at IGF, we've been hearing the use of the of the word regulate, like do platforms regulate content in a sort of using regulation more loosely. But I'm going to focus on uh, the more like old-fashioned definition of regulation, which is top-down and what the gov how the government might regulate or not regulate content or platforms. And um, I think I'll speak about two things. The first is about why I think that content regulation m or platform regulation is somewhat of a dirty word or maybe a red flag for a lot of Indian civil society in the tech space. And I'll explain a little bit of the history of why that is. And then the second is I'm also, so I'm a policy fellow with Mozilla, but I've also been a visiting scholar at the University of Amsterdam uh, at the Information Law School. And they are doing really interesting work on not so much fake news, but on filter bubbles and, and how people feel about that. So I thought I'd introduce that work and, and maybe 
talk a little bit about where I think a global south context and perspective uh, would compare or would be, an, would be an interesting room for research in the future. So to begin with, um, I think when we talk about content regulation, we presuppose that there is a regulatory mechanism that has both the capacity and the jurisdiction to regulate. Both of these issues are entirely up in the air in India right now. So in 2015, the telecom regulator came out very infamously uh, with a consultation paper which said, there are these over-the-top providers, they are existing in, are they existing in a somewhat of a regulatory vacuum? Who are the regulators that can regulate these entities? Do they have regulatory presence? And in the process, that consultation became a big mess because everyone, they were talking about everything from, you know, a, a rape that happened in an Uber and how there was no way to apply criminal law to such, some of these companies, to hate speech, to revenge porn, to telecom operators that were saying, you need to regulate these guys because they're offering communication services but aren't being licensed. So it was like a whole hodgepodge of people that wanted to get into the mix to find some way to address these actors from a regulatory perspective. And so for obvious reasons for the tech civil society community at that time, this, this raised fears that there was going to be a very blunt instrument that would be applied by the government. And worse still, that it would maybe be a kind of backdoor entry to allow more government control over internet speech. Uh, and not just on speech, but also uh, sort of a blow to innovation. So the term licensing regime in the consultation paper got everybody really worried. So they were like, what is going to come? And what is this going to look like? And so there was a huge backlash. So I think what, I mean, I gave all this context just to say that it's sometimes important to remember why it is that maybe like Vidushi said, sometimes we get really worried when there are like blanket statements made about content regulation because I mean, we fight quite hard to make sure that this is a space where government intervention is kept somewhat at bay. But at the same time, I, I hope, and I'm, I'm starting to see that there's more space to finally talk about platform accountability in ways that are not co-opted either by government or by, for example, the telecom sector lobby. So I think there's, uh, I'm, I'm happy that that space is growing. Yeah, so, so that's on that. And now on just very quickly on the work that I'm doing with the Information Law School at the University of Amsterdam, what they've done is they've interviewed, they've done focus groups and qualitative interviews with users across the European region, uh, but with a focus on, on Germany and France. And they've been asking users, like, how do you actually feel about the filter bubble? Do you know that, but, but particularly in the context of personalized newsfeed, they ask if you knew that your newsfeed was being personalized and without, perhaps without your consent, and it was based on a profile, how does that make you feel? Do you enjoy the fact that you get more tailored news, or does it make you uncomfortable? So some of what people are saying is they don't like to be boxed into a profile and they uh, there's a German word for it which I can't pronounce but it basically means uh, they struggle they want more flexibility uh, to play with their data and play with their profile and therefore see information that they might not otherwise and I thought this is interesting in from a from a I mean if I can call global south is like very broad but from a global south perspective I was speak uh, I think learn Asia is doing some really interesting work in Myanmar and they're finding that uh, a recurring theme in people's use of social media is this ability to play with their identity. So to have multiple profiles which have different ethnicities, genders, religious backgrounds, and that gives them an opening to speak to people they wouldn't otherwise, see things they wouldn't otherwise. And so I think that conversation might actually be quite advanced in some of, in, in some of some parts of say South Asia or Southeast Asia, and we wouldn't even know it. So I'm quite excited to see research on uh, profiling, as it is called, and, and how people feel about having personalized news feeds from these different contexts. Well, thank you. You were like perfectly on time. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I think to your point of like there are different uh, perceptions in the global south. We spoke about this a lot when we were proposing the panel because even to say global south, I think is to kind of have a sledgehammer approach because it's so different, like say in India than it is in Egypt. And I think what we're also trying to do is unpack what's similar, but also how we're different 
uh, and also maybe focus a little more on how we're different because that then leads to uh, questions about how do we configure national jurisdictions and how do we understand international human rights law uh, in that context. Thank you so much for that. Uh, now we turn to my colleague from Article 19, uh, Masa, who's been doing some amazing work in Iran um, and also has been focusing on platforms. And so we'd love to hear from you. Over to you. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about one particular platform that I don't think a lot of people understand how uh, relevant it is to the context of Iran. And I approach Telegram from two perspectives in that I see Telegram as this platform that has all of this rich information to understand online discourse in Iran. But from the civil society perspective, I look at it as this platform that has so much to do in order to deliver on human rights considerations in a country where freedom of expression is oftentimes um, very much put under risk. And so to look at um, some stats, in Iran, there's a population of around 80 million. and there's about 45 to 50 million people online in Iran. That's the internet penetration. And Telegram as a platform has about 40 to 45 million monthly users. So the ubiquity of this platform in terms of internet use and communications and ways that people are using social media, shopping, everything is centralized to this one platform. And so, um, there's a number of reasons why this platform has become such a ubiquitous tool for Iranians. Uh, it, but the main reason is, is that it's one of the few foreign platforms that has not been censored yet. In 2009, Twitter and Facebook were both censored. And um, over the years, there's been a push. There's been a more moderate government that's been trying to prevent these platforms from being censored. And um, in 2011, not quite 2011, but 2015, there was a huge migration from Viber over to Telegram, which has kind of led to its popularity. Um, Viber was kind of disparaged for having roots to Israel, and it was being throttled. So users kind of have come over to Telegram, and it's the most comparative um, case of Telegram, I guess, would be Line in China, where it's also quite a central platform. But the concerns that arise are, what is the role and responsibility of this company in this context? And how is the government kind of reacting and creating new policies towards this? So in terms of the fake news discourse, um, it's really risen inside of Iran. And I guess um, this is the greatest um, gift that President Trump has given to governments like the Iranian government, which has really bolstered their their um, their way to crack down on this kind of content, which is something they've been doing for ages, which is trying to control and manipulate how information flows in um, within a country. So Telegram channels, which is which are how most people are doing sharing information, and it's the social media platform. Um, has become a great source of concern for the Iranian government. There have actually been instances where there have been fake news um, scares. Uh, in 2015, there, for example, there was one viral news story of um, Tehran being shut down because there was a police shooting happening, and it caused a considerable amount of panic inside of Iran. So it does have actual um, these actual concerns. But then um, there are other instances where they've pinpointed um, channels that have aligned themselves with opposition groups. Like there's one channel called Ahmad News, which has aligned itself with the Green Movement, which was the protest movement that happened in 2009. And um, the Iranian government has actually asked Telegram to shut down this channel because they had a vi one viral news story of the Speaker of Parliament's daughter being associated with Mossad and GCHQ, and it, w it had caused quite an amount of controversy. And Telegram uh, refused to shut it down, and then the government, or um, I've been studying this, people who are loosely affiliated with the government started a series of bot accounts that started um, spamming Durov and Telegram on channel with the hashtag block Ahmad News. And then um, Durov came out very strongly and said he stands for freedom of expression and they only censor anything related to violence, um, mainly ISIS channels and things like that. Um, 
the government has kind of institutionalized the way that it is trying to censor and control Telegram. They have made um, it mandatory for anyone inside of the country who runs Telegram channels to uh, seek permission and get a license to run a channel that has more than 5,000 followers. Um, and this has led to the fact that the government now has the in information of a lot of the social media users, a lot of Telegram administrators, and there has been a series of crackdowns where they have found the administrators and arrested mm -hmm. them. Uh, and so that's of particular concern. Um, and, um, but from the civil society's perspective, though, um, what is really of concern is how Telegram approaches this huge responsibility they have in a country like Iran. Uh, Durov is very reluctant to engage with, um, with organizations like Article 19 so far. Um, in a recent interview he gave, he said he's motivated by curiosity and he finds it super interesting to see what it's like to run the most popular social media platform in a country like Iran, which is a little bit dismissive of the fact that there are people who are actually um, being arrested, being um, really their safety and their security is being compromised because of the fact that they're present on this platform. In terms of security, um, there's a lot of specific considerations in being in Iran. There was a series of hackings that the Iranian government did of notable journalists who were on the platform, and they did it through two-factor authentication, um, uh, breaking in into the accounts through two-factor authentication. And so Telegram has been available to try to retrieve these accounts, but it's mainly been reactive. Um, just last week, there was one um, flaw where uh, the service notifications from Telegram were being uh, kind of um, brute forced into in order to uh, spearfish for people's login information and Telegram reacted to it. And so what we really want is for Telegram to start working and engaging with civil society, with activists, with journalists and those at risk to sort of not be so reactive to this and like be prepared for these considerations in this context. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Maza, and this closes the first very diverse uh, set of interventions. So we have now 10 minutes for questions. Please state in your name, be brief, and then we're going to have the next speakers. So who's first? Oh. Who wants to break the ice? Please, close yours. Uh, I am uh, Rupinder Parhar from India. I am in the Internet Service Providers Association of India as one of the governing board members as well as on the governing board of APNIC. Uh, hence, uh, I uh, think I am competent to make certain comments. Most importantly, I am also a resident of a country called India, and hence, I think I need to make some comments here. Uh, <clears throat> we talk of fake news. We all have been discussing it here just now. Now, let me tell you how things uh, get a little uh, uh, taken, misunderstood. Just now, this young lady from my country only uh, gave a very animated uh, speech on how the government came out with the consultation paper and how there was a lot of hoo-ha as to what is going to happen. I would like to ask what happened. What happened was that government of India has banned zero rating. It's the most positive uh, signs our government has taken. Let's not, uh, let, uh, let's not take things piecemeal and convey impressions which are not right. Unnecessarily it creates uh, this thing. Two, the Information Technology Act of our country was flawed. What has happened? The Supreme Court has taken a decision and struck it down. The civil society is charged. So all these things make a difference. So what I would request is even at this meeting, whenever we are talking, the news, whatever we are trying to convey must be full and not in pieces. Otherwise, it is misunderstood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't sure if that was a question. It seemed like a statement. We're only uh, asking for questions at this point. But I do think it's important to let Amba respond to that because uh, actually just respond to that. Yeah. 
Thank you, sir. So just to, I guess, just to give everyone the full context, yes, there was a paper on OTT regulation in 2015, and uh, it had as a sub, a sort of almost as a the last few pages talked about net neutrality. So that consultation on net neutrality then proceeded separately on its own. And so what I was drawing attention to was the first part of the paper, which brought up OTT regulation and spoke about the possibility of a licensing regime or not. That, that consultation has not been closed, and in fact, uh, a month ago, the telecom regulator has announced that they, that they intend to take forward that consultation. So it's very much a live issue in India, and it will continue to be. Uh, so I think uh, just to explain why on an issue like OTT licensing, the whole of the tech community is, is sort of always skeptical and always suspicious. I thought I'd just give people that context and, and where we come from with that suspicion. Uh, what I would like to say here is, remember, there, there, there in the world, there will be all kinds of no, no, no. That's all. Okay. So uh, I'd encourage you to take this off, man. Uh, my mic is now working. No oh, we have a second question at the back, please. Hello, I'm Bruna. Um, I had more of a comment slash question to Wagner um, regarding the Brazilian context. All the initiatives I've seen so far on, on fake news were to an attempt to prevent people from working on writing things online regarding political persons. So in my view at least, it's more of a, a way, um, like a frontier to combat fake news regarding the political class is, and not a misinformation campaigns um, thing deleted. And I'd like to ask um, um, Carl, uh, Wagner in this sense, if they are discussing anything other than protecting the political class and their honor, something like this. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, okay, uh, fortunately uh, <coughs> the bill uh, protecting the political class hasn't passed, so uh, we still can talk uh, against the political class freely. Um, <coughs> there is no problem with that. And <coughs> I know that there is a lot of campaign about um, how to uh, to be careful with the uh, fake news, and uh, also uh, I, I see a group of uh, organizations uh, try to get together uh, as a fact checkers, but uh, the great discussion is who check the fact, who check the fact checkers. Yeah? So this uh, uh, issues is still something that it's not clear for everyone and we need to bring up all those topics which is not clear for everyone. Um, my concern is uh, what we can get as a result of this not well discussed thing. First is uh, some uh, laws that can uh, restrict the freedom of, of expression and also uh, we can also create some kind of intermediaries like fact checkers that uh, might not be as much as transparent with their algorithms that we would like to see. Uh, because we have seen already, for instance, uh, Le Monde uh, in France with uh, its platform for uh, uh, select or uh, define which is fake or which is not fake. Uh, Facebook is also moving to uh, create an uh, algorithm to detect what is fake news, what is not fake news, but this all, all these algorithms seems to be not enough transparent for the entire community. So who's going to check uh, the checkers? Uh, that's my concern.
Thank you, Wagner. Any other question? If not, if it's not urgent, uh, then we move to the next uh, panelist, uh, Lillian, who is unfortunately uh, in the slightest South Africa, but she's actually <laughs> from Uganda. Sorry about that. Lillian, the floor is uh, yours. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's still morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> Yes, I'm um, from Uganda, but I work with an organization that also looks at South Africa. So um, I'm good to be associated with South Africa at, at this point, since I'll be, um, I'll be presenting some perspectives on dealing with fake news from Africa. I work with a, an organization called the Collaboration on International ICT Policy in East and Southern Africa, in short, CIPESA. And uh, every year we focus on um, the issue of uh, internet freedom and uh, uh, we look at different um, issues. And this year we, we, we looked specifically at the role of intermediaries in promoting internet freedom and um, challenges and uh, opportunities for addressing internet uh, or respecting internet freedom in Africa. And one of the issues that came through this report was how intermediaries and uh, governments are reacting or responding to the issue of fake news. Um, what we found out was um, fake news and, um, is at times, you know, fake news, false information go hand in hand. Um, there's no clear definition of what fake news is, so it is defined according to how, you know, someone, you know, sees or classifies whatever is false or not. And um, this is, um, this is um, um, having a lot of interest um, from many um, African governments on how to regulate social media. One is in uh, passing of uh, legislation or using uh, um, existing uh, cyber security reg uh, legislation um, in trying to control this whole big elephant called fake news. Um, our concern is uh, what we found in this report, whereas it is legitimate uh, you know, to control the spread of false information or fake news, whichever term we may call it, in repressive states like many from, our, from my region, this is being used to curtail freedom of expression. And um, the other thing was uh, what we found that um, fake news um, you know, or false information um, at times it's also treated as offensive communi uh, communication or, you know, communication um, looked at or information looked at as uh, trying to incite some sort of violence or something. Uh, or at times some even, you know, categorize fake news or false information as defamation. So there's quite a lot of uh, different jargons uh, that are being used to kind of agree on what is fake news. But... Um, Nonetheless, we've had stories or we've had incidents where fake news, you know, has been, you know, used to spread um, certain, uh, you know, uh, rumors and one in, in places um, during the elections in Kenya this year. Um, there were fake news, uh, you know, um, someone was spreading fake news. We don't know where, where, where the source was, where the source was, but uh, there were false, um, some CNN videos, you know, someone created an account and, you know, try to uh, make it look like CNN videos and um, this guy is, you know, uh, CNN and BBC, you know, and these were widely spread on, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter and uh, WhatsApp, um, which is one of the biggest uh, way in which uh, false news is being spread. But also we are seeing uh, uh, citizens trying to push back um, in regard to how to address false information. Um, case in scenario in Malawi, um, between uh, September and October last year, there were quite a uh, spread of rumors and uh, speculation about the whereabouts of the president, and the state wasn't responding, so um, uh, citizens created a hashtag, uh, bring back uh, Mutharika on Twitter, it trended, until you know, government had to respond and you know, uh, uh, declare the status of the, where the president was at that particular time. But also what we are seeing is, um, um, Facebook uh, reacted in regard to the, the fake news uh, and the electionary period in Kenya, created a platform and, you know, you know uh, reacted to the Kenya incident by, you know, developing mm -hmm. some tools and specifically targeting Kenya to how to address this whole uh, Facebook uh, uh, false, news, uh, <laughs> false news spread. Um, the other thing, although what I wanted to highlight is uh, in, in Uganda, I mean, 
not just in Uganda per se, but in Africa, we also seeing uh, some countries like uh, in DRC um, where it's kind of controversial, but uh, fake news or false information is used to raise, uh, you know, awareness <laughs> about, you know, um, about some uh, injustices within community where people feel that, uh, you know, they are not getting their voices heard and they are creating these sort of false stories, you know, to, to point out that, you know, we're experiencing this and in reaction, of course, you know, the government, you know, responds back. Um, but what does this mean uh, when we have no clear definition of what fake news is and, and where we have no clear ways on how to justify what is fake and what is not fake? Uh, what we are seeing is, um, where I come from, we are seeing so many people um, trying to access or utilize, see the positive side to using um, uh, these uh, social media platforms. We are, of, we, we are worried that, you know, um, as people come online and they are having this sort of fake news and there's really no clear strategy on how to address it. I know in Kenya there have been some sort of guidelines that are being developed by government, but many, uh, many a times, you know, uh, governments are just pushing back, calling people, you know, social media terrorists, like in Zimbabwe. So people are not, uh, we, we are concerned that uh, there may be um, a point that people may stay away from, you know, using these platforms for, for a positive, you know, um, positive way. And uh, this is leading to, you know, self-censorship, um, uh, but also for the government, we are seeing, you know, um, increase in, uh, you know, internet shutdowns or internet um, uh, disruptions. Uh, we are seeing lots of uh, uh, takedown requests to uh, some social media platforms, and we think this is not, um, uh, uh, it's not a, a long, uh, long uh, lasting solution to how to address this whole phenomenon. Uh, but also we are seeing that uh, how intermediaries are responding, uh, especially um, telecom uh, network operators and uh, ISPs is, they're not giving the issue um, that much attention that it should be done from say from the, from the global uh, perspective. Case in point is uh, Vodafone operates in um, quite a number of African, one minute, yes, African countries and uh, Whereas Vodafone um, has this huge transparency, you know, report, I think it is one of the uh, service providers that, you know, um, release, releases, a, a, um, uh, what is the transparency reports, but the terms and conditions, you know, in the countries they operate in are not that clearly visible. In, in many of the African countries, you, there's nowhere to access for users to know that, you know, to utilize, you know, our platforms, this is how you should, you know, these are the terms, this is what we promote and this is what we not promote. So <coughs> there's a lot of uh, lack of awareness about the existence of, you know, these uh, terms and conditions or user policies for um, these uh, ISPs. And also, of course, the issue of, you know, um, digital literacy is still, um, li digital literacy and media uh, literacy is still a huge concern on how people should, you know, um, take advantage of the benefits of social media or, uh, um, these other social media platforms. So these are some of the things we are trying to, to address. So yes, um, <laughs> I got the, 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 the clock, so I'll just stop here and maybe engage after that. Thank you very much, uh, Lillian, for so graciously accepting uh, the, the warning sign. So next uh, in line is uh, Romina Garrido from um, Datos Protegidos in Chile. Romina, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Um, thank you, girls, for the invitation to talk about this issue and the situation in the s one of the <coughs> southest countries in the world, Chile. Um, we, we, um, um, I work in Datos Protegidos, an NGO who defend privacy and data protection in digital and physical environments in our country. And we were, we were thinking about this panel uh, and the problem of fake news. We, 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 we think that this, the, this issue must be observed in a, larger, in a larger framework of the rights and freedom who are involved. It's not just uh, freedom of expression. Um, 
is privacy and data protection also, because the data management by the platform is an issue. When who is manipulate, manipulate the information, s know so much about ourselves and our in interests and tastes that show some special content <coughs> designed for us. In this context, it's important to take into consideration the specific condition of the Global South, specifically in Latin America, because we identify certain ca characteristics that we are repeated in the Global South in, in, the, in our countries in Latin America that sharpen and complicate the treatment of fake news. In the first place, a very complex situation of freedom of expression and certain cases. Re rightly, with the physical security of journalists, mm -hmm. is that an issue in Latin America now? The Press Freedom Index of Reporters Without Borders catal catalog most Latin American countries like an area with visible problems uh, in, in this kind of situation. In second place, in the region, we have a high concentration of ownership of the media. According to Observacom also, in Latin America, the market of percentage co of media concentrated by the main operator at 80%. In my country, Chile, this figure rise in the 90% of the concentration of the media. In the third place, our population still receive or non receive a precarious formal education or don't have education. This is a very important issue when, when the responsibility is also in the user to be capable to distinguish be between an information, disinformation or fake news. And of course, the lack of compliance and implemented of data protection law in our country which are seen and often manipulated by governments and company as a barrier of freedom of expression or barriers to connectivity. Well, many reports are recognized like that, is that, that in Latin America, we, 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 we are, uh, the government are use the, the, this kind of tool to manipulate social network or so, so social media. Uh, a report of the University of Oxford are identified the intervention, intervention of social network in Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, and Venezuela, for example. And we know that Facebook and Twitter, like the main platforms, that the people who are act actually are informed and in, in Latin American countries, um, they announced pilot m measure to report face new users. And that sense, we observe that, it, that in Latin America we have a double <coughs> problem. By one hand, the objective of warring, rising the manipulation of social network, which atomic, atomicize and distort <coughs> the public debate. In our country, we are, we are people usually inquire through platforms like Facebook or Twitter. By the other hand, we have enormous concentration of the media. There are some bills in Latin America the, that some countries or some authorities think that, the, that we need a legal solution about this issue, like Colombia or Costa Rica. They have bills who penalty fake news and try to make some uh, definition about this issue. In Chile, um, we have uh, we have related the, the the fake news issue with political propaganda. We we have a, a, a media law who defined uh, who penalty when media spread the defamation or, or dissemination of hate speeches, but we have a tricky definition about who we can understand as, as a media platform. Blogs, for example, uh, and internet <coughs> media are not considered inside that law. We have also a specific rule for political propaganda in digital em environments. And in, the, in our NGO, we, we implement an um, a independent project in Chile who was developed in UK. It was Who Targets Me. 
and try and and in this project we we try to identify the um, public the ad the dark ads in the political campaigns in Chile. So the um, the extension works like a ad blocking, but instead to blocking, they categorize like a publicity. And this tool allows to also determine when the content are put in for, uh, are put in, in the social network intentionally for us. So we have recently a uh, presidential election last, this last Sunday. Um, and we, we used the, this tool for approximately one month and a half, and we were to publish the results soon, I hope. So we, we thought this, this is a political issue, but it's also a marketing issue. Marketing for the <coughs> political propaganda are moving to the edge of the ethical, because it's possible to handle people in their political options. Some French, some freshly example of, of my country of fake news is the, for example, the media's, the media's, uh, the, the media's um, published that uh, who actual president have a Parkinson disease, for example. Uh, and, and the last Sunday, uh, market vote uh, flows in different uh, Twitter accounts um, and it was the same vote, but the, the information said that there, there was a market uh, or um, are, um, uh, that we have a manipulated election. But not just political issues are involving fake news. For example, uh, issues like ethnic and migration take the debate in Chile also. Blame, for example, the Mapuches or, uh, or ethnic group for the fires that hit Chile the last summer, or the relationship between fake news with the speeches that oppose to the migration against, for example, Colombian people in our country. So to finish, is the regulation the answer or the solution for fake news in the countries like my country. Uh, we think that not. Uh, we think that we are talking about, uh, we, we think that we, any policy of control must fire and ensure conditions of sufficient impartiality. Who controls the, control, the, the controller, controller co like, like you say be before? Because uh, if nobody, is, is, if you know have uh, this impartiality, uh, every measure against fake news can become a tool of persecution of dissidents. If we think, for example, if we can, con can cons consider impartiality measures like Facebook and internet.org uh, that, we, we that they want to give to certain areas of the world free internet and of course free Facebook. And if that platforms management all the information, the powerful, they, they become an incredible powerful tool to people in Colombia India, and yes, one more minute. The second idea is training, training to the people, digital li literacy, and of course training uh, journalists and, and how this, the missing, the, the um, uh, how to um, adding to the, how do the, the, the misinformation affect the formal education and finally accountability and transparency in the operation about the political in our social networks. That's all. Okay. Uh, my mic is now working. Uh, so a couple of things. The first is Amba needs to leave because she has a flight to catch. Thank you so much for being with us and for your excellent intervention. Um, and yeah, we're sorry we, you couldn't field more questions, but uh, you can find her on Twitter. And do you want to give us the quick? <laughs> My Twitter handle, uh, against all odds, I've, I've been told to change it, is at Amba on Adventure. So if you want to continue this conversation, <laughs> you can. Thank you so much, Amba.
Um, and now we move uh, swiftly on to Kelly Kim, who is the general counsel at OpenNet Korea, and she's been doing uh, super interesting work uh, around the regulation of fake news. So it'll be great to hear from you. Hi, um, can you hear me? Okay, I'm Kelly, has been introduced just before, and OpenNet Korea is a civil society organization in South Korea uh, fighting for internet freedom and uh, digital rights in South Korea. Uh, I have three points and um, some of them resonate with what other panelists already <coughs> have mentioned. So first thing, um, fake news is not a new, new phenomenon. And second thing, in South Korea we already have many laws that are used to regulate um, fake news, something like false news provision or defamation laws and the public election um, act, etc. And they have been abused by those in power before the democratization of South Korea by the dictators and these days by the politicians. And as such, criminalization of false news or fake news is against uh, established international human rights law. And third point is that um, the noticeable um, recent trend in fake news regulations or bills is that they target intermediary, intermediaries um, like platforms imposing monitoring obligations and liabilities on like Facebook, Twitter, or other platforms in Korea. We we have like other platforms that are like dominant in the market. Uh, but the thing is, um, these, um, it, it's, it's an intermediate liability issue and these laws, making these laws will make the fight uh, for free speech, freedom of expression harder for our um, for digital activists, digital rights activists like me. So um, first point, Fake news is very recent uh, phenomenon in the sense that uh, the presidential election in the U.S. last year and the election of Donald Trump ignited all those controversies and debates around fake news and its regulation. However, fake news or false news, where the content of a piece of information is false, has been with the humanity uh, from the beginning. What I'm saying is that um, fake News has been there all along, and we just call them in different names, like false news, false information, rumors, propaganda, misrepresentation, lies, etc. And secondly, in South Korea, um, we, we have many laws that stifle free speech in the name of <laughs> cleansing false information, um, false news, or defamation. And they have been abused uh, by those in power like dictators and politicians, like um, like in F like Lillian also mentioned. Um, uh, however, there are a slow slew of international human rights law that condemn punishing or criminalizing of uh, for speech. For the time's sake, I wouldn't go into the details. But to support this, I want to introduce a case. Uh, of Minerva in Korea, who was charged and arrested for spreading false news, but later not only got acquitted, but also got the false news law struck down as unconstitutional by our constitutional court in 2010. So he was uh, then um, like anonymous economic pundit whose blog um, obtained a huge following of hundreds of thousands of daily visitors in like pre-social media age, um, like and he um, predicted, for instance, um, the downfall of Lehman Brothers. So he also current, uh, criticized the government's exchange rate policy, manipulated to give advantage of large cell phone and auto exporters such as Hyundai or Samsung. Uh, as the expense of small to mid medium-sized companies, and of course to the race of the conservative politicians who then called for a criminal uh, investigation um, for like, for what? And in 2010, our creative prosecution force did come up with a provision 
um, this false news provision, and they um, charge. Uh, charged Miner Minerva, this guy, for this false news, mm -hmm. spreading false news. And then he got arrested. He was in prison for almost more than a year. But in the end, um, we came together to defend him at the court and also file the constitutional compla complaint against the law itself. And we won. <coughs> and how we won? Uh, there were many... Uh, strategies, but among them was that we made a strong constitutional argument. We re also, we received um, the help not um, directly from Article 19, but from the case that Article 19 argued in Zimbabwe, um, and also the Canadian case of Zundel, the Holocaust denier. denier. Um, and, and the case was really helpful. So um, just something is forced. Uh, it does not mean it should be regulated. Uh, so only actions that cause damage like libel or fraud can be the subject of such regulation. And even if a statement is false, even if it's a piece of fake news, uh, it can help uncover the truth uh, in the marketplace of ideas. So I, th I believe that strict uh, regulation can have chilling effect um, state statement um, that are true or close to the truth. Um, third point, um, as I just mentioned, uh, fake news has been, uh, fake news regulations have been abused by those in power, and nowadays it is also those politicians that demand more fake news regulations to be mm -hmm. legislated. Uh, but, but the thing is, um, the thing is, in South Korea, it has been the state or the government who spread fake news. For example, it has been proven by the government, I mean, by the court, uh, that the National Intelligence Service, the, kind of like the NI, NSA of the US, ran a special task force that posted almost a million tweets, uh, replies, and online postings to interfere with the presidential election in 2012 that, to get uh, the impeached president got ele get elected. So uh, one, yeah, I will get to the point. So one noticeable trend is that those fake news bills proposed by um, those pro politicians target intermediaries because they already learned that like targeting the speaker or the speech doesn't work. It's unconstitutional. Uh, but the thing, I and mean, it is also the international trend, but. I think we should be uh, worried about making uh, platforms to be the censorship agents of the state or the government because when we incentivize um, or mandate platforms to regulate fake news or our speech, our freedom of expression or users or user freedom of expression are easily compromised as, as the platforms or intermediaries have no reason to fight back for us. And it makes the fight for freedom of expression very hard because we have to go after the intermediaries first before we're confronting um, the regime or the state or the law itself. So lastly, I want to say just one thing from a member of Global South. So dear Global North, you are setting so many bad examples these days that you are making my life as a human rights activist uh, in the global south, very hard period. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly. Now there is a last minute update. Um, we I didn't have time to, ch to change the slide to reflect the fact that Malavika is not able to be with us uh, in this specific session. So this uh, concludes our uh, round of table of interventions and the floor is open for questions for about 15 minutes. So please, there, I see a question coming from the end. I would like to uh, just make a point of order. It's a code of conduct of, of the IGF. Let's try to respect that, be polite to everyone, and especially the names of the speakers are there or online. Please address them by name so that we know whom you're talking to. Please, uh, Sunil. Uh, apologies, I missed the first 30 minutes of uh, this session. Uh, my question is, shouldn't we follow the money isn't the problem that Facebook and Google have taken away 
most of the advertising revenue from traditional media and therefore undermine the business model of producing real news. Uh, so in a sense, the solution is that traditional uh, media actors and new media actors should come together uh, and build their own ad networks and uh, remove their dependency on f Facebook, reclaim their ad revenues, and reclaim the business model for uh, real news. Thank you. Do we have any panelists who want to specifically address that question? I can try. Uh, which is at the beginning of this project, we were thinking of how the different business models uh, speak to each other. So we were actually thinking of looking at uh, tweaks in the algorithms versus increase in fake news, and uh, also thinking about the incentives for different parties involved. Um, but as a researcher, and I think we've spoken about this very briefly, as a researcher, I don't know how to study that because the data is all with the other side usually. Um, and also, secondly, I think it is a little more complicated in that people just like to believe bad things about people they don't like. Or we just like to believe bad things, uh, and we're usually more receptive to it. And which is why I think it's as, as important as the business model and as, as valid as I think your point is, I also think we need to think about how do we uh, account for these more social science-based approaches, because I don't think one fix is going to solve the problem. It's a bit of a bit of a ducking of your question, but uh, I hope that's okay. We have another question at the back. Please introduce yourself. Yes, hello. My name is Anna. I'm from Switzerland. I'm a compliance officer. Uh, and my question is, um, you speak about fake news, but I would speak up about fake profiles. The problem is the platforms have fake pro profiles. And the, way, the only way to tackle them is go to maximum transparency, which would be to give them an identity number or an ident identification to each user, yeah? Um, do you think that th this would be easier for companies that work with these uh, uh, profiles and this would be good for governments because they could, you know, control everything, yeah? And obviously you can, um, still use uh, like um, um, hotmail accounts with different numbers not, not or different names but behind would be always an identity number like a unique user and the other way to control people is as well to to control hardware so like so if a user that is not supposed to use a, a computer is using it Apple reacts, for example, at the moment th it does exist. So my question is, do you think your countries would be ready or, uh, to put th those users and those governments to, you know, to, to um, systematize uh, um, a, a unique user number that will be behind all the Hotmail accounts or e Gmail accounts mm -hmm. and um, any, any profile in any platform? We do have a couple of people here who want to reply, and probably more. So let's start from this side. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think the Egyptian government would be super excited about that for all the wrong reasons, because it will make it very, very easy for them to arrest whoever they would like to, because they would just have to go and look up that number wherever, and then there's no, because multiple profiles, like it was mentioned before, is a good way to avoid, you know, all the, the restrictions and the rules and the algorithms and like all the mod mode of control that both companies and governments put on us. So to ask for such a user registration number, I think is a really, really worrying move in the wrong direction because also for, uh, let's think of, a, for example, LGBTQ community, right, where your registered name or number will be very different. So maybe the, the, the possibility to have different names and different profiles gives you safety and protection. And, and then also, I just wanted to make another point because we, we keep trying to, um, we talk about fake news and like, I think underlying there's this like desire to define objectivity and truth. But I don't know, in the end, we have to be conscious of the fact that truth or news aren't, 
we could, there is no truth and there's no, I mean, at least from my background, I'm from a social science anthropology background, so truth is always subjective and it's only with these platforms where we have collapsed contexts from different backgrounds that we're trying to achieve some sort of like absolute truth which doesn't exist. So I just wanted to also add that point uh, at the moment. Um, I think I very briefly alluded to the active um, uh, policies and regulations the Iranian government already has in place where they are trying to identify users online. So Telegram administrators and users oftentimes if they have a large following do have to register and this has already been abused for there was a series of mass arrests back in March. So the very short response that that is a very dangerous road to go down. Thank you. Go ahead. <clears throat> I think uh, from from Africa, uh, also not just Africa per se, like she has said, I think um, we need to have um, uh, provide a way of you know some users to remain anonymous. So it uh, in in like I said in repress uh, repre uh, repressive states, uh, this is would, this would be quite um, um, something that the governments would be you know very excited about. And I think to me that would uh, lead to further violations of many user rights. So I think the question is then striking a balance between anonymity and you know um, identity uh, identification or, or those sort of thing is something that um, still baffles us. And we, it's good we are having this conversation. I think it's something that we need to find a way of trying to address. We may not have a solution right now. <laughs> Um, I remain on the same, on the same page. Uh, I would just add the, the fact is once you open space for identification on, on the net, you, you encourage surveillance and content control. So I, I prefer to defend the anonymity in the, in the internet in not open space for any kind of identification uh, only under uh, <coughs> decision by law. Um, yeah, and I want to add to what other panelists already said. In Korea, we already had the system um, so the Korean government introduced this internet real name law back in 2009, but it got struck down by the Constitutional Court in 2012 because we have, it's a human right, right to anonymous speech and right to anonymous communication is a human right. And this law clearly infringes on those human rights and it caused so many problems. This real name, internet real name law caused so many problems in Korea and we are still fighting for it, fighting for the residue. So it's not, uh, it's not a good idea, not just a, a good idea. Not, not, it's not just a bad idea, it's the worst thing um, you can, um, or system you can in, introduce to fight against fake news. No, just a comment, so follow up these ideas. I think that it's very, uh, we live in a huge imbalance between users and companies. So implement solution like that, just put the, the charge of the, the load of this situation in users in, and not in companies. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one from the audience. I didn't see a hand earlier. Uh, in that case, can I just invite the panelists to maybe sum up uh, your input uh, on today's panel, maybe in one or two sentences, so we know what we're taking away from the panel, and then we can end. <laughs> uh, can we start at the end? Mm, so I think that try to well, continue the, 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 the same as idea as my colleague uh, to my side said. Um, we can put the, the responsibility 
about the content is just in users. Um, there's a huge responsibility from companies, from government, but it's very difficult to, to decide who has the responsibility at the end of the day because one of other solution just empowering governments, for example, or companies for surveillance. So it's a tricky issue. I don't have the answer. Uh, but we are continu continuously reflecting about that, about how these kind of things not just affected freedom of expression, uh, because there the is not an absolute right if even affect uh, privacy and data protection issue and this that would be uh, should be a concern in our governments in the global south in Latin America. Uh, <coughs> we know that uh, we are at risk when the next president of our uh, superior court for election in Brazil says we are going to create a preventive structure for fake news which includes measures of constriction of property, measures to restrict the freedom of those who are in flagrant delicto, preparing to commit this type of strategic crime, said the minister. That's all. Um, for me, I think, uh, like we've had, I think, from my colleague from South Korea, um, um, fake news or fake news is really not something new. It has been there. It's just that it has just been amplified uh, by social media. So I think addressing it should be shared responsibility. We cannot put this role to just governments or um, uh, intermediaries, but also it is uh, um, something that users also need to be aware of, you know, ab we're aware about how to, you know, identify what is false and what is not false. So I think there's that bit of individual responsibility to be also to know when to, s when to share or reshare information that you think is not you know, worth sharing. So I think we need to clearly um, identify what the different roles of all uh, stakeholders is, and then maybe we'll find some sort of you know, um, common grounds on how to address this. So from the context of Iran, which is where I was speaking from uh, today, um, for a country with a government that flagrantly disregards uh, the voices from the human rights community, it becomes very crucial to rely on um, work by these companies. And so my main takeaway would be what are ways to engage uh, companies like Telegram, where their main aim and goal for, be for existing is not necessarily the security and human rights of Iranian users, but to be a profitable corporation. How do you engage um, a actor like this in a setting like IGF, where they're usually absent, and how do we create a more productive um, environment for a platform that has become so crucial to access to information and freedom of expression. Um, yeah, I think I want to echo um, what's been said before. Because um, we have a situation where we have those for-profit for companies that have basically created some of the mess that we're in now, and it's on us to figure out how um, how to find solutions to, um, to, to, yeah, to reconcile the situation. And I think it'd be good to have solutions that keep the different contexts in which those platforms operate in mind, um, which is democracies, but also the, the very authoritarian and restrictive settings in which we operate, where more surveillance is definitely not a step that we should be taking to, um, to control this matter of fake news. But um, on the opposite, I would follow up with what Lillian and Wagner suggested with more critical thinking skills and more, maybe a way to go is to like increase our capabilities to analyze what is fake news or what where does information come from, who has produced it, and to maybe, I know, take steps in then more towards that direction and to increasing transparency of flow of where this information comes from. Thank you. 
Um, uh, it was really great to have the, this discussion, um, especially from the Global South perspective, because as um, it's in the session in session uh, description that it's it has been mainly a uh, Global North discussion and Global North debate. So even within like Global South, like every country has very different background and context regarding fake news regulations. Um, so I hope that um, this uh, discussion and debate can continu continue in the future. And um, thank you for inviting me to this great panel. <laughs> So thank you very much for being so patient in the last day of the IGF. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, it's not a random choice that most of them were women. We're very <laughs> proud of that. And I hope you share uh, our excitement. Uh, this is just the beginning of a conversation. We are going to produce a white paper, and um, we are going to get back to you maybe in the next uh, IGF. And uh, well, I guess it's time for lunch of four, the next panel. Yeah, well, uh, Article 19 is uh, <laughs> holding another panel on human rights impact assessment. So if you are interested, please head on over. Um, I'm not sure which room it is, but it's somewhere here. <laughs> um, thank you so much. For anyone interested, it's room 26. Thank you.